Then we'll spend a few moments in quiet reflection and take time to respond to God before we dismiss. We'll be together just over an hour and you can follow our order of service to know what's coming next. Let me show you how. Grab your phone and go to votrweekly.org. It's the best way to stay up to date on everything at the Vineyard. In addition to the order of service, you'll find song titles, announcements, sermon notes, and next steps. If you're new here, we'd love to connect with you. While you're on votrweekly.org, click the Next Steps tab to introduce yourself using the quick form, or grab a Next Steps card from the back of a chair, fill it out, and drop it in an offering box. We'll follow up this week to start a conversation. Giving an offering is a great way to invest in joining God's mission, transforming all things. We won't pass the offering baskets during the service. Instead, we invite you to make giving part of your worship by placing your gift in one of the boxes in the back of the sanctuary or by giving online. Just look for the giving link at votrweekly.org and follow the prompts. Well, service is starting soon. Whether you're on the live stream or you're in the sanctuary right now, we want to invite you to stand as you're able and join us in singing to God. The lyrics will be on screen to help you make these songs your prayers today. Good morning. Welcome to the vineyard. You guys are looking good today. Baptisms. You guys want to go ahead and stand as you're able. We're going to lead you in some worship. My name is Mia and this is Matt. You guys, first I'm going to um, read to you some, some scripture. This is Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will thank the Lord with all my heart as I meet with his godly people. How amazing are the deeds of the Lord. All who delight in him should ponder them. Everything he does reveals his glory and majesty. His righteousness never fails. He causes us to remember his wonderful works. How gracious and merciful is our Lord. He gives food to those who fear him. He always remembers his covenant. He has shown his great power to his people by giving them the lands of other nations. All he does is just and good, and all his commandments are trustworthy. They are forever true to be obeyed faithfully and with integrity. He has paid a full ransom for his people. He has guaranteed his covenant with them forever. What a holy, awe-inspiring name he has. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of true wisdom. All who obey his commandments will grow in wisdom. Praise him forever. You know what? I miss my capo. And the whole band came in in the right key, and I was in the wrong key that whole time. So we're going to try this one more time. It's a good morning. 
Yeah. But here we go. Let's try again. That sounds better. See the tomb. See the tomb where he lay. See the stone rolled away. He is risen. He is risen. He's alive. See his hands. See his feet. Touch his scars. Oh 
Behold you anger and rich in love. Let's sing this scripture together. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. Slow to anger and rich in love. Sing it again. The Lord is gracious. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. Slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all that He has made. And as far as the east is from the west, that's how far He has removed our transgressions. and compassionate slow to anger and rich in love the Lord is gracious and compassionate slow to anger and rich in love for the Lord is good for the Lord
transgressions from us. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is gracious and compassionate.
God, we lift you up with all of our praise, with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and all of our strength, God. We lift you up, and we pray, God, that you would be seen clearly here in this place, that we would see your heart, that we would experience your nearness, that we would experience your grace, God, your grace today. Would you let it flow down over us and cover us completely? It's in Jesus' name that we pray and that we sing. And everyone said, Amen. 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 You guys can have a seat. Middle schoolers, you can be dismissed at this time. Your leaders are in the back, and they can take you across the hall for service. Well, good morning. It's so good to be with you all. Happy Sunday. My name is Natalie. I'm one of the pastors here at the Vineyard. Welcome to everyone on the live stream as well. I'm so glad that we have an avenue for you to be a part of our service and join our gathering. So today is a special Sunday. The baptismal is set up up front, so we're excited to celebrate baptisms together later in the service. And of course, last week was Easter. We had a great time worshiping with everyone. And this week, I'm going to be wrapping up our series, You've Heard It Said. This is a phrase that Jesus used many times to point people toward him. He would start the phrase, you've heard it said, and would then continue on saying, but I say to you. He was always pointing to the culture and calling people to live in a different way, calling people into more. We've looked at certain phrases in our culture, like you do you, or you're dead to me, and we've used scripture to see how Jesus would have responded to these cultural phrases. As I was preparing for the final message in this series, I was reminded of the one time that I got detention. It's true, Mom and Dad. (laughs) My parents are here this morning, and now you know, one time! And I will never forget the moment that it happened. I was completely mortified. Now, you all know Jeff's story. We have very different stories. Stark contrast in our high school years, right? Major different stories about getting to detention and getting in trouble. Lots of different stories about getting in trouble. <laughs> so you want to know what I did? I got, ch- I got caught chewing gum in my English class. <laughs> I can't believe it. Can you believe it? It was awful. I remember it. I just felt crushed. Chewing gum was against the rules in my class, and I got caught. I got detention, so it was my own fault, and I got what I deserved. So this gives you a a picture of this high level of responsibility I have. I do not like breaking the rules. Jeff likes pushing the limits. I love staying within the limits. I love living within them. I never liked getting in trouble. I never wanted to do something that would elicit discipline. And that brings me to the title for the message this morning. You've heard it said, you get what you deserve. You get what you deserve, or it might be, you had it coming, serves you right, or you asked for it. These are all examples of the same thing. A more positive would be, you deserved it. You earned it. Right? If you're catching it, it kind of points to this transactional mindset. Spiritual equations that are transactional are more like karma than the kingdom. Karma says if you do bad, you get bad. If you do good, you get good. But the kingdom is all about transformation, not transaction. I personally can think of a lot of parenting examples. Right now, all three of our kids are in an elementary school. We're in the life stage where we get to repeat ourselves over and over to help them learn and to help them grow. And it's also important for their development that they learn consequences. Kids try things just to see what happens. So this is a constant learning curve for them, and there are many times that they do get what they deserve. For instance, if they're not ready for school in time, they're going to be late. It doesn't bother me if they're late, but they don't like missing morning recess, so it does bother them a lot. But if they're late, they're going to be late. Another example, I remember the first time that one of our kids started unrolling the entire roll of toilet paper, (laughs) and the joy on their face was, it was so exciting. (laughs) You can just feel it, the excitement of this new toy that they've discovered. But as much as it was joyful... (laughs) I also didn't want it to keep happening, so I needed to step in and I needed to have a conversation, letting them know that that was fun, but now it was done. Thank you, Daniel Tiger, for awesome quotes like that. (laughs) 
I, I needed to communicate that if it happened again, they would have a timeout because sometimes you do get what you deserve. If you steal something, you deserve a certain discipline. Or as the Bible says, the wages of sin is death. But if you only use that verse and you only stay in the negative, you're going to have a pretty heavy-handed church. And the result of your gathering or discipleship could be filled with guilt or shame. The truth is, sometimes this phrase can be used in the positive. If you save a bunch of money, you'll have plenty for retirement. If you take care of your car, it should last longer. The phrase, you get what you deserve, can be used in a positive or negative way, and that is how it would be used today. Thankfully, we know how Jesus would respond to this modern phrase because he dealt with the same thing 2,000 years ago. Our scripture passage for this morning is this, is in John 8, 1 through 11. Verse 1, Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him, but Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer, so he stood up again and said, All right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, Neither do I. Go and sin no more. This woman was not just accused of sin. She was actually caught. This was a bad moment for her. The religious leaders said that she deserved to be stoned. But Jesus, in this moment, he paused. He created space, and he rewrote her story. They wanted this transaction. She did this, so she deserves that. But he responded in a new way. Jesus seeks transformation, not transaction. Instead of the phrase, you get what you deserve, Jesus said, I do not condemn you. Go and sin no more. You are free and forgiven. It does make sense when looking at our culture how we might have a hard time with this. We've been conditioned toward retribution or payback. Um, or punish, the, the punishment fits the crime is another way to say it. Those are all ways to say you get what you deserve. But in Christ, we aren't condemned. We are forgiven, set free, we're reestablished, and reconciled. Look at verses 10 and 11 again. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, Neither do I. Go and sin no more. Now that Jesus is on the scene, things are changing. You don't get what you deserve. You get something new. Before the cross, they dealt with, sin, with extreme sin in extreme ways, but that's only because the cross hadn't happened yet. The sacrifice of Jesus was still to take place, and because Jesus knew he would personally be paying the ultimate price, he handled sin differently. When Jesus showed up, everything changed. Instead of demanding truth and being heavy-handed with accusation and retribution, Jesus led with incredible grace. Now, he didn't say that she was right to live that way. He clearly spoke the truth and called out the sin in her life, but he also forgave her at, the very same, at that very moment. When Jesus responded to the woman, he married grace and truth perfectly. He taught us a new way to live. Now, in order to apply this to our lives today, we need to ask ourselves an important question. How can you be more like Jesus? How can you be more like him to your family, to your friends, and even to those in the church? 
As parents, Jeff and I like to, we, we want to be like Jesus. We, we want to marry grace and truth when we respond to our kids. And it's, it's not always easy. Parents, you know the days when your kids are just at odds or they're, they're fighting or they just don't stop, right? We've all been there. We've all experienced this moment. And in these moments, it'd be really, really easy to make it about all truth, it would be all about this transaction, right? So you did, you did this, so now you get this. You acted this way, so now you get what you deserve. I remember a time when I took away all the kids' toys from their room, and I regretted it quickly after because then I had their toys pouring out of my room. It was this quick decision. You get what you deserve. This is what we're doing. Not one of my parenting success stories, right? <laughs> On a different day, our kids were acting very similarly, so we, we sat them down and had a serious talk about their behavior. Once we finished our conversation, we all got in the car, and we went and we got ice cream. They did not get what they deserved. They got something completely better, right? We went and got ice cream. Now, we don't always parent this way, and I'm not telling you to parent like this, but it is an important way. It is, it's important to think about creatively how to demonstrate and discipline like Jesus. This happens in parenting. It also it happens in marriage. We work hard to offer truth and grace in our marriage as well. We're going to make mistakes. And we're not going to do everything perfectly. But our marriage isn't a place to condemn it's a place to support and model Jesus, offering grace and truth as best we can. Maybe your marriage is in need of truth right now. Maybe it's in need of grace. But just like parenting, how can you creatively think of ways to love your spouse like Jesus? And we have to think about this in parenting. We have to think about it in marriage, and, and we have to think about it in the church, too. We desperately want to be a church that looks, acts, feels, and demonstrates Jesus all at the same time. That means grace and truth both, truth without condemnation and grace that is not cheap. Now, the church has hurt people by zeroing in on truth and forgetting about grace, but we need both if we truly want to be like Jesus. If you went back to the passage and tried to modernize it just a little bit, if we took the woman that was caught in adultery and used 21st century language or even like a real-life example for, for today, it would probably sound something like this. Natalie, this woman got a divorce. She needs to be kicked out of the church. And unfortunately, this is a, this is a real example and it breaks my heart that people have actually been kicked out of churches in these moments. Some of you have personally experienced this before, and hopefully at the Vineyard you've been welcomed in in a different kind of way. This is a place that you can belong. This is a place for healing because, like Jesus, we won't condemn you. But maybe it's not divorce. Again, if we're going to modernize John 8, who would get dragged before Jesus for judgment? Would it be addicts or drug dealers, the prideful or arrogant? Sometimes in churches, we even drag other Christians before Jesus. It might sound something like this. They're too conservative. They're too progressive. Or they're too charismatic. Don't you know what he's done? Don't you know what she's like? I don't want to take communion with someone like that. I don't want to pray or worship or get baptized with someone who's done those kind of things. Now, if you can imagine anybody getting dragged before Jesus, you have to also imagine him bending down and saying those same words. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. When we were missionaries, we basically had a house church. And around our table, we had gang members, drug dealers. We had murderers, uh, victims, and perpetrators. This, this was our reality. We still have pictures of our friends up in our office. And... And everyone was invited. And if you would come through our front, front door, you would know that you would have a seat at the table. It was probably a sight to see. We invited, invited the neighbor kid who stole an Amazon package from our front door. 
I don't know why, as a 12-year-old, he felt the need to steal that Amazon DVD, but it turns out it was the Chronicles of Narnia. <laughs> so we just hoped he'd fall in love with Aslan and Jesus all at the same time. <laughs> well, we bought, we bought a huge table so that we could fit everyone there, because everyone in our old house and everyone in this room, everyone tuning in online, we're all sitting at the same table. Now, here's the thing. Just because you're invited to the table doesn't mean that the Bible will agree with everything that you do. It doesn't mean that your lifestyle perfectly will align with Scripture, and God might ask you to change some things. But you're still invited, and I am so thankful that we are in a church where everyone is welcome. There's always room to grow, and we all want to become parents, spouses, and church members who balance grace and truth. But in order to do that really well, we also need to balance it within ourselves. So, which brings me to the next question. Where do you need God's grace? We all want to be more like Jesus, holding grace and truth together. But in order to do that, we need to experience more of his grace in our own, in our own lives. What's the sin that, that in your life that you feel like if people from the church knew that you would get condemned for. This hidden sin that you're afraid might get you dragged before the pastoral team, maybe before your boss or coworker, maybe your parent. Now, some of us don't have a hidden sin, but maybe there's a part of your life where you're always asking for forgiveness. And I, and I don't mean just like a little bit, right? I mean, every time you pray, you feel you need to confess and repent all over again. I talk to people all the time that are still repenting for something that they did years ago when God has already forgiven them and moved on. If most of your prayer life is just saying sorry for your past, it might be an indicator that, that you need more of God's grace than you realize. Maybe you need to personally hear Jesus say the words, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. If we only got what we deserved... If that phrase was actually true in the Gospels, we wouldn't get forgiveness. We'd get punishment instead. The scriptures say we've all fallen short and we've all missed the mark, but here comes Jesus. Forgiving us again, picking us up again, he's dusting us off again. We don't get what we deserve at all. We get forgiveness time and time and time again. His grace is better than you could ever imagine. Like Jeff said two weeks ago, his forgiveness has no limits. So if you're constantly repenting or hiding sin or always asking for forgiveness for these decade-old sins, what would it feel like to not have to spend any more energy on the past? If you've been living in truth, maybe it's time to experience God's grace. If, you've, if it's been all grace, maybe you need to experience his truth. Jackie Hill Perry, a poet, author, and theologian, she says it this way. We are pendulum prone, being either all grace, no truth, or all truth, no grace. Only Jesus was able to do both perfectly. With that, it's only in Christ that the pendulum is kept still. As a pastor, I've noticed that a lot of us are, we're really good with truth. Most of us, if we're honest, are too hard on ourselves. So today, where do you need his grace? Where do you need to finally accept his forgiveness? And what would it like if Christ settled that pendulum inside your heart? This morning, we're doing baptisms. This is a part of why we do baptisms. When you go under the water, you leave everything behind. You completely surrender. You come up out of the water, washed clean. And it is a picture of the gospel that Jesus Christ doesn't scream, you get what you deserve, you get his new life instead. If you're here this morning and you find that you are at a crossroads, that, that you're in a place where it's time to finally lay down all the ways that you've condemned yourself or held on to the past, maybe baptism is for you this morning. 
We've asked people to sign up before the service. We have a handful of people that will be getting baptized this morning. But if you decided that this is, this is what you need today and you haven't had time to sign up, we have clothes for you to change into. We have towels. You can get baptized today. There's going to be space later in the service to change and, and do all of that. We'll let you know if that's you. When you come to the communion table and you remember all that Jesus has done, this is another opportunity for you to surrender and to recognize that all your sin, all your shame, and all your baggage has already been paid for and forgiven. You just need to come and receive it. You've heard it said, you get what you deserve, but Jesus says, I will not condemn you. You are free and forgiven. No shame, no condemnation. Your slate is completely clean. Let's look at verses 10 and 11 one more time this morning. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. As I close this morning, I want to share a story I read a while back about an African tribe. It was all about how this tribe handled criminals, offenses, or sins committed against the other. When someone was caught or they came forward to confess, the entire tribe would stop what they were doing and encircle this person. You can imagine how intense this might feel as the man or woman in the middle. You've made a horrible mistake. Now everyone knows about it, and they're staring at you. They've stopped their day-to-day to address it, but they don't come with accusations. They don't come with judgment, and they don't come with a plan to fix everything. One by one, the community would begin to speak, and they would share all the good things they've come to know about the person in the middle. They call out their identity. They celebrate the person apart from sin. They completely disassociate the the person who they were created to be from the mistakes that they made. Like this tribe, imagine your hidden secret, something that may be filling you with shame or anxiety. Imagine the sin of your life brought right up here to the stage. Speaking that out loud in front of everyone in the room and online, Take a second to imagine that this morning. But imagine that after you've confessed your sin, you brace for impact because you're about to get what you deserve, right? But instead, we all start shouting compliments about you, the ways we see Jesus in you, your Christ-centered identity. Think about the body of Christ coming around you. This is a profound picture of grace and truth. Now, obviously, we can't do that on a Sunday morning. It's too big, and not everyone in the room knows each other that well. But this is why we love small groups. This is why we love lifelong spiritual friendships. We've got people in our church who've been meeting for over 30 years, and that's amazing. They've raised kids together, right? They've become empty nesters together. They've retired together. God moves in powerful ways through community. And our hope is that you find lifelong spiritual friendships that you can see through the ups and the downs of life. You have people that could call out those good things in you. Like that tribe or like our church, it's only in community where you can experience either you get what you deserve or neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. I know what kind of church that I want to be, and I know what kind of church that we want to become, right? One that embodies and displays the fullness of the gospel. Let's finish with a quote from Tim Keller. He says this, The gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. This grace and truth. More flawed than we can imagine and more loved than we ever dared hope. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for your grace and ending. Lord, we do not deserve this. And we are humbled by what you offer to us, Lord. We are humbled by your ultimate sacrifice, God. 
Thank you that we are condemned no more, Lord, that we are free and forgiven in you, God. I pray that you would meet each person in this room and online, Lord, that you'd be speaking to them and setting them free right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Here at the Vineyard, we, after messages, we want to take a few minutes of of kind of a quiet space. The band's going to play quietly behind me. But we feel like if we keep moving right now, we're going to forget all that God is speaking to us. So we want to take just a couple minutes to reflect on all that you've just heard this morning. So I want to invite you to do that. If you are getting baptized today, I also want to dismiss you. You can go ahead and go change and get ready. And if you are someone that uh, decided last minute that you're like, I want to get baptized today, um, uh, Corey is going to be around, and she'll be able to help you get changed and ready for that. So we can find someone in the back by the sound booth and make that happen today. So take a few minutes as the band quietly plays and think about this question. Where do you need to experience God's grace in your life? I'll be back up for a time of response and we'll get ready for baptisms. Let's stand together. We're going to respond together this morning. There are multiple different ways you can do that. So I want to encourage you to respond right away because we want to be ready for baptisms. We've got the kids coming in to celebrate with us. Uh, This morning, I want to invite you to the table. Come forward for communion and acknowledge all that Jesus has done for you. You can also receive prayer this morning in the back. Our prayer team would love to pray with you and for you and support you in that. And you can also give as an act of worship. Again, let's let's celebrate together. We're going to be, another way that we can do this is worship together. And then we're going to celebrate baptisms. And I want to invite you to celebrate everyone that's getting baptized today. Let's worship. Please. 
shame no longer has a place to hide and I am not a captive to the lies I'm not afraid to leave my past behind I won't be shaken no I won't be shaken and my feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love my feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love my feet doesn't stand a chance when I Are you guys ready for some baptisms? That's what we need. If you're new to the vineyard, that's how we do it here. We celebrate loud on the way in, on the way out. This is a special, special moment. And so we want to hear you celebrate. My name is Jeff. If we've never met, I'm the lead pastor here. And you just have to know, this is one of the most special things that we do. And, and just in case you've forgotten or maybe you've never seen a baptism, I want to give you just a little bit of an insight on why we do this. First, we do what's called a full immersion baptism, where we're going all the way under and all the way out. And the reason we do this, one, is because it's demonstrated to us that way in the Bible, that when people got baptized in the day and age of the Bible, they got dunked completely, but also it's symbolic. That when you go under the water, you are symbolically saying, I'm leaving my old life behind. I'm dying to all of my old ways, and I'm finding my new life in Christ when I come up and out of water. Now, you'll see that if someone tries to hold a hand out or a foot out or a belly out or a head out, I'll push it under. Because when we follow Jesus, we always try to leave something out of the equation. I'll give God all of this, but not this. I'll follow him in all of these ways, but not this way. But baptism symbolizes in every area of my life, even if I don't do it perfectly, I aim to do it for him. And so that's why we go all the way under and all of the way up. I also wanna say there's a bunch of people tuning in on the live stream. And I don't want you to be a passive watcher this morning. I want you to be engaged. Everyone here is going to be engaged. And so one of the ways you can be engaged at home is as we baptize, you can be praying and asking God's blessing over every single person that comes into the tub. The tub, we call it the baptuzi here at the vineyard because it's about 102 degrees in here. It's about, it's a really fantastic hot tub. You guys are gonna love getting baptized this morning. I'm telling you, it's feeling good. So can we get started? Let's welcome Grayson this morning. So Grayson, have you decided to leave your old life behind and embrace your new life in Christ, making him your Lord and Savior? Do you hope to follow him as best as you can from this day forward? Yes. Upon your confession in Christ, we baptize you today in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Welcome Stella. <laughs> Stella, have you decided to leave your old life behind, finding your new life in Christ, making him your Lord and Savior? Yes, I have. That is awesome. Well, upon your confession into Christ, we baptize you today in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I'll 
didn't know when you came, you were in the splash zone, did you? This is Aaliyah. Can we welcome Aaliyah, everyone? Aaliyah, are you committing to leave your old life behind, finding your new life in Christ? Are you making him your Lord and Savior from this day forward, following him as best as you can? Yes. And upon your confession in Christ, we baptize you today in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's welcome Savannah into the tub. Savannah, are you wanting to leave your old life behind, finding your new life in Christ, making him your Lord and Savior, and from this day forward, following him as best as you can? Yes. That's awesome, Savannah. Hold my hand here. And upon your confession of faith, we baptize you today in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Spirit. Jaslyn, everybody. Jaslyn, have you decided to leave your old life behind, finding your new life in Christ today, making him your Lord and Savior, and do you aim to follow him as best as you can from this day forward? Yes. That's awesome. Well, we're going to baptize you today in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Everybody, can we welcome Alexa? Alexa, have you decided to leave your old life behind and embrace your new life in Christ, making him your Lord and Savior, and from this day forward, following him as best as you can? Yes. That's awesome. Then today, Alexa, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. time there. <laughs> Nick, are you willing and ready to leave your old life behind, embracing your new life in Christ, making him your Lord and Savior, and aiming this very day to follow him as best as you can from this day forward? In absolution, yes. Absolutely. That's awesome, Nick. Nick, today we baptize you upon your confession in Christ in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
you, Jesus. Thank you that we can celebrate new life in you, God. We worship you, and we thank you for this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for celebrating with us this morning and being here. We're going to kick off a new series next week. We'll see you then. Good.